I'm Ty McCormick and I'm an editor at Foreign Policy Magazine. With the help of the Pulitzer Center, I was able to travel to South Sudan in August and September to report on the civil war there as well as on the humanitarian crisis that it's generated. Now the situation I found on the ground was bleak. More than a million and a half people had been displaced as a result of the fighting. Hundreds of thousands of people were without adequate food, water, and sanitation and many thousands of people had been forced to take refuge inside UN bases throughout the country, where they were waiting out the violence in what were horrific conditions. Now, the peace talks, meanwhile, that were taking place in neighboring Ethiopia were making very little headway, and actually since the time that I was in South Sudan, they've collapsed altogether. South Sudan, it seems, will be at war for the foreseeable future. Now, the overarching question that I had going into this project is actually a very simple one. How did we get here? Because in 2011, when, Sudan, when South Sudan declared independence from Sudan, there was a tremendous sense of optimism. The birth of the world's newest nation had been seen and widely hailed as a U.S. foreign policy success. And yet here we are, less than four years later, mired in yet another civil war. So over the course of six months, I conducted more than two dozen interviews with current and former U.S., U.N., and South Sudanese officials in an effort to weave together a portrait of the road that brought us to where we are today. Now the story that emerged is one of multiple failings. First and foremost, it's the story of tremendous challenges faced down and tremendous errors made by the leaders in Juba. On a secondary level though, it's the story of a U.S. foreign policy failure, one in which tensions between and within U.S. administrations alienated the South Sudanese government, reduced American leverage, and in some cases, blinded U.S. officials to the warning signs that South Sudan's ruling party was breaking apart and heading the country in the direction of civil war. Now, I'll share just one piece, one little anecdote from the report, which appeared in Foreign Policy magazine, that I think speaks to this broader erosion of U.S.-South Sudan relations that occurred during Obama's presidency. Now, at the time of the first meeting between President Obama and President Kiir in 2011, one of the toughest, thorniest issues that U.S. Uh, policymakers who were working on South Sudan were facing was Juba's continued support for rebels that had been left north of the border after partition. Now, nobody questioned why Kiir's government would continue to support these rebels. Uh, they had fought alongside one another for decades against the government in Khartoum, and Kiir's government was under tremendous political pressure not to abandon these former allies. But nonetheless, President Obama felt that this was no way for a newly independent South Sudanese nation to begin on the world stage. So after months of reaching out to the government in South Sudan and pushing them on this issue, and after months of getting nowhere, President Obama took the opportunity of his first meeting with President Kiir to confront the new leader with satellite images of his army's covert actions in Sudan. Now this wasn't out of the blue. The US, uh, U.S. officials had reached out to Kiir's delegation prior to the meeting and zeroed in on the importance of building trust during this meeting. They had said, basically, even if President Kiir is not prepared to acknowledge the covert actions of his military, he should at the very least tell President Obama that he was looking into the issue or that he would take the president's concerns under consideration. Under no circumstances should he lie to the president of the United States. But when President Obama confronted Kiir with these images at the meeting, Kiir's response was to suggest that the United States check the accuracy of its satellites. Now, my sources in the room tell me that President Obama was so taken aback by this response that he ended the meeting abruptly. And Princeton Lyman, who served as Obama's special envoy to Sudan and South Sudan at the time, told me that the U.S. president has never trusted Kiir since. So that's just a small slice of this ebb and flow in the U.S.-South Sudan relationship, which is explored in the piece and which I hope sheds some small amount of light on the U.S. legacy in South Sudan.